Father, we thank you for this time again as you grace our presence with your presence. Let your word go out like a two-edged sword today, Father. Let the listeners receive in Jesus' name. Satan, we rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Go now in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We want to continue on talking about the blood of Jesus. He's our example. Number nine. We've been talking or teaching on the blood of Jesus now. This is, I think, our third uh, section the Lord has given us. I'm not sure. But we've said that the blood of Jesus redeems us, it justifies us, it sanctifies us, and it makes us righteous. We want you to know that those that God calls, he redeems. He sets them apart, he justifies them, and he makes them righteous. So that they can reign and rule in this life, he sanctifies them. He sets them apart to do his works. And that's the initial initial redemption, justification, sanctification, and righteousness is achieved through God imparting it to us by the word, the blood, and the Holy Spirit. Then there's a continual changing or conforming us to the image of Jesus, Romans chapter 8, 29, and 30. I think it's verse 29, it tells us, For whom the Lord foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And what God is after is every person to be rightly related to, back to him as Adam was and as Jesus was when he came on this earth. Christianity in my lifetime has missed the mark greatly, but God is beginning to raise up men and women in the church today that can hear his voice and that will obey his voice and that will have one purpose and that is to do the will of him. When Jesus came to the earth and died, actually after three and a half years of ministry, died, was buried, rose again, and ascended into heaven, he only did what he saw the Father doing. His doctrine was not his. He only spoke the words the Father told him to speak, and he did nothing on his own accord. He said the works that he did were the works of the Father. So you and I need to come to that understanding and that realization that without God directing us, we're just nothing, absolutely nothing. Actually, we're nothing with him directing us, but it's his power in us that causes us to achieve the things that he desires. I want to talk today, we've talked about redemption and a little bit of justification, uh, We're going to get to all of it. Redemption means, as we said, uh, to loose away, spirit, body, and soul. And, of course, justification. Uh, God wants to justify, which means perfection, actually. You must see there was never any impurities or imperfections in the spirit, body, and soul. And it tells us in the scriptures that... It's clear to anyone that reads it, the church that Jesus Christ is coming after when he comes back will be without spot and wrinkle. And they will be a ruling and reigning church and and they will not be under the circumstances. Listen, and as I see in scripture, the world will be afraid of them. They were in the book of Acts. They stoned them and they beat them, certainly, but the reason they did, because they were afraid that their doctrine was going to invade Jerusalem. There obviously came a time to where they did invade Jerusalem, because there was about 3,000 added one day, and 5,000 added the next day, praise God. And I don't know, and I don't know how many people were being added during that period of time, but it was a short period of time. But I am convinced that you and I are living in a period of time where God has poured out his spirit on this earth. 
God is making and preparing vessels and making them new wineskins and not old. And then his spirit will be manifest through those individuals in such a powerful way. The world will be afraid again. Actually, if you just take time to reflect on this day, right now, before the holidays, the chaos in the world today and the governments that are being toppled in the American government and the judges and the courts and everybody that's in authority in America and the way they're being tossed to and fro and all of the, listen, I guess I may as well be bold and say all the corruption that's being exposed in government agencies in America, in ministries, and throughout the world, really, is only the act or the finger of God. Listen, it is God that has toppled communism. It is God that will topple every ministry that is not of him. He will bring them down. It is God that is showing us how our judges in this land, how our district attorneys in this land, how our courts wrongly accuse people, falsely accuse them, and then put them in prisons and just forget about them. It is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that's put his finger on you, and he will continue to do so. You know, if you read in the book of Daniel, it is frightening to see. It says, God put up over the kingdom. God put up over the kingdom of men, the basics of men. And it's God that puts up kings. And it's God that puts down kings. It's God that puts up judges. And it's God that puts down judges. And I think if you would just take a little time to reflect the way that the the Supreme Court is designed today, which is incredible to think about it. And just, uh, if you will, just Tip back and forth, the way it tips back and forth, basically any way that you want, uh, they just do it however they want. And we have basically four judges on one side and four judges on the other side. I don't know if you're familiar with the Supreme Court, the way it works. And we have a lady that makes a decision which way it goes. I think that's pretty much typical of our land today, the spirit of our land. I mean, if you have ears to hear here, you'll know in Isaiah chapter 3, 8, it says, because of the tongue and the doing of the nation does not please God. Now in Isaiah, the third chapter, it says, women will rule them and children will oppress them. That's Isaiah 3.12. And that's basically what we're having in America today. Well, I didn't know we were going to get into all of this, but let's get into it, Father. Thank you. Talking about the gift of righteousness, uh, it is very appropriate because you reign through the gift of righteousness. I like for you, I'd like for you to turn to 1 Corinthians 1.30. Actually, God slips up on me sometimes and speaks things out of my mouth that I'm not prepared to say in my mind. But I think I might as well make it plain. In many cases, Sandra Day O'Connor can make the final decision which way something will go in America. And that is not the will of God. I'll make that plain. 1 Corinthians 1.30 But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Notice that God has made to us through Christ Jesus righteousness. In Romans 3.13, it states here as the Apostle Paul is writing, Romans 3.19, excuse me. Now, we know that what things soever the law saith, It saith to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. The purpose of the law is that every mouth be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Please hear that. If you want to be under the law, fine. That's where your guilt comes from. Romans 3 verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, 
there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Notice, no flesh be justified in his spirit by the law. Why? Because by the law is the knowledge, is the knowledge of sin. Listen, verse 21, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Notice now that the righteous of God without the law, listen, the righteousness of God without the law. If America could just read that without the law. In addition, that is without the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments is part of the law. You read in Exodus chapter 20 and you'll find that out. So the righteousness of God, listen, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets. And then in verse 22, verse 22, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference Notice the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. The word believe is a simple word like trusting in, adhering to, and relying on. It is not a single decision at some point in time in your lifetime. And then departing from those ways or from Jesus and doing your own thing and saying that you were born again, there's nothing further from the truth than that. The word believe, my friend, is to trust in God, commit your body and living, uh, commit your body, a living sacrifice. Romans 12, 1 tells us which is our reasonable service and then we will know by the mercies of God. Let me say it again. Which is our reasonable services, are our reasonable service, and then we will know by the mercies of God that ye present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. That's the perfect will of God. And then we will find this, that he gives us the message of faith according to his will to carry out whatever he desires in our lives, not what we desire in our lives. Christianity that I was raised in, well, it knew nothing about the ways of God. That's all there is to it. And let me say this, the religious people of America, it matters not which denomination it is, knows very little about or nothing about the ways of God too. That's simple. Well, they don't act like it. Jesus states this, and I think it's in the book of John. Well, I know it's in the book of John. John 8, 39. He says to the Jewish people, if you are Abraham's children, you would do Abraham's work. Well, carrying this one step further, if you were the children of God, you would be doing the works of God and not your own works. And here in this uh, verse 22 of Romans 3, it tells us the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Jesus Christ, comes unto all and upon all them that believe. And Jesus did. And if you'd like to back up to Romans 1, 16 and 17, the writer here being the Apostle Paul makes this statement, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. The gospel clearly defined in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, 3 and 4 as the death, burial and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And here Paul says, I'm not ashamed of that, of the gospel of Christ. Why? For it is the power. The word is dunamis. Dunamis. Listen, the ability of God unto salvation and the word salvation is deliverance from every hindrance, every hindering influence. It is the gospel. The gospel is the power, the ability of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to everyone that believeth. Listen, listen, listen. It is the gospel. The gospel is the power, the ability of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Notice there's that word believeth again. And we saw that in the third chapter of Romans, uh, verse 22. 
that righteousness, the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, is upon all and unto all that believe. Here it tells us that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. To everyone that does what? To everyone that believe it, that relies on everyone that trusts in, everyone that adheres to the Lord Jesus. Actually, Romans 8.14, please turn there. Romans 8.14, those that are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. Listen, in the 12th chapter of the book of Hebrews, it tells us, it tells us, Hebrews 12.6, that every person that every son that God receives, he correct us. And it tells us in the 12th chapter, those that will not receive correction end up being bastards. Hebrews 12, 8. I remember preaching in a church, a Methodist church one time, and I read that scripture, and after the service, I was shaking hands with the people that were in the congregation. And a lady walked up to me and she said, uh, uh, you know, you don't talk like that in our church. And I said, talk like what, ma'am? She said, well, you cursed in our church. And I said to her, no, ma'am, I read the Bible in your church, but I can understand you not understanding that because undoubtedly you haven't been reading your Bible or you would know I read a scripture, you know, and praise be to God, I pray for her. Now, they just are illegitimate children. That's what a bastard is. They're just out there illegitimate. If you're not being led by the Spirit of God, my friend, Romans 14 tells us you're an orphan. The church basically is a group of orphans in America and in the world, really. But here he tells us that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Then, verse 17, Romans 2, 17, it makes this statement. For therein, therein, referring back to the gospel, to the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written. The just shall live by faith. Uh, to quote, listen, to quote Habakkuk 2, 4, the just shall live by his faith. Notice here that Paul states the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel of the Lord Jesus. It's faith to faith, see. Now, when God begins opening up, when God begins opening up the Bible to you, as he did when he began opening it up to me and showing me about the law and the New Testament, I was absolutely stunned to find out that the Ten Commandments had been set aside the day that Jesus died on this earth. Actually, the Ten Commandments were set aside the day that John the Baptist started his ministry. See, he started preaching the kingdom of God. You can find this in the Gospels. I think it's in the book of Matthew. Uh, Matthew 3, 2 it is. The law was until John the Baptist. From that time on, it's been the kingdom of God. Listen, so everything that you and I receive and every ability that we receive to reign and rule in this life, and that's what righteousness is all about, see? Righteousness comes through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. It does not come, my friend, by your confession. It does not come, my friend, by you knowing and memorizing and reciting many scriptures. It comes by your believing that the power of God is available to every person unto salvation that believes that Jesus died and was buried and rose again from, listen, when God began teaching me about the gospel and trying to bring my mind and heart into control and see what he was after and when I finally did see what he was after I could not believe that anything so simple as that Jesus died was buried and rose again on the third day could be power that was beside me likewise let me say this I recall the first time as I began to look back in Second Chronicles and other areas, like when they took Jericho in Second Chronicles 20:21. 20, it was difficult for me to believe that 
I think they went out singing, praise the Lord for the mercy endured forever, Second Chronicles 20, 21, and that's all they sang, just over and over. Uh, praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. And God gave them the victory. That used to trouble me. I used to think, why didn't they sing or write the whole song in here? Why didn't uh, they tell us the whole song? Also, I remember when Jesus fed the multitudes, how he just looked up into heaven and gave thanks. And then he broke the bread and the fishes and started to distribute it. And he fed and picked up 12 baskets of the remains. And I used to think, why didn't they record his whole prayer? God showed me that, that they did. He just said, thank you. Praise God. That's all you have to say is thank you. So religious people think they're heard for their long praying, their sad faces in their long robes, actually. But nobody pays any attention uh, in heaven to your robes and your sad faces or your hypocritical prayers. Jesus said they were hypocritical. I didn't. Amen. So the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith through the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Let's look at Romans 4, 3. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was, listen, it was counted unto him for righteousness. Abraham believed God, and it was counted for him for righteousness. Listen, now, I want to just tell you about Abraham for a minute, if I may. Please listen. When he was about 75 years of age, uh, God told Abraham, it's recorded in Genesis 12, 1, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And Abraham got up and obeyed, dwelt in tents in the land of Canaan. And God had promised him a son when he was about 75 years old. And when he was about 100, he had it. Now, let me show you this. What saith the scripture? Abraham believeth God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Romans 4, 3. That man had to believe for 25 years. My mom prayed for me for 25 years in the little church that she went to. And the church told me that after I got saved. They said every Sunday when they would ask for a prayer request, my mom would stand up and say, pray for my lost son. 25 years. Now, Abraham, as I said, had to believe for 25 years before that son came. And it was counted to him for righteousness. And the righteousness that came forth was Isaac. That was the righteous act of God. Listen, are you listening? So Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. And when the righteousness act was manifest, his name was Isaac. The church knows little about faith and righteousness. You think about 25 years. Most of us do not believe God for a week or two weeks or a month or a year. This man believed God for 25 years. My little mother believed God for 25 years. You say he made some mistakes. I agree. He made one, but God didn't condemn him for it. He just got right back on track and kept on believing black in the saddle again if you want to say it like that or back in the saddle again in Romans 4 4 now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace but of debt I want to back that up with verse 3 Abraham believed God he relied on he trusted in his body was dead and Sarah's womb was dead and he did not have physicians he did not have medical attention to assist him or he did not have Viagra listen or he couldn't write the body of Christ or, or, or the faith people letters and say look my body is dead and Sarah's womb is dead and we're supposed to have a child we need your help he didn't do any of that one of the things God has taught me about the body of Christ. 
You can receive this or you can reject it. It doesn't matter to me. But what they call faith in the body of Christ basically is not faith at all. The reason that we have prosperity that works for ministries in America and then they rely on medicines for their healing is because the letters that are written asking for money is not faith. And that's why their faith will work for their money. Listen. Their faith will work for their money because their faith is in the people and it's not in God. I received a letter a while back from a minister thanking his partners and thanking his partners for how they had blessed his ministry during that year. Well, my friend, no man blesses me. God blesses me. He blesses me through a man, and his name is Jesus, and he's our example. If you don't like that, that's okay with me. I really don't care. That's not my business. That's between you and God. But it's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that blesses me. He may do it through you, but if you refuse to obey him, He'll do it through somebody else. And I'm not going to give you credit for blessing me. I will give you credit for obeying God. But I will give God only, God only the credit for being the blessing. He's the one that blesses me. And the church needs to get that straight. You know, why we say things like that is because we want to be important. And we want to feel important. Why, I'm just a blessing to you, Brother Rick. No, you're not. Well, you might be. You just might be if you're obeying God. But you're not a direct blessing to me. You're being in obedience to God. Let's understand that good, okay? If God orders it, fine. If not, fine. Doesn't matter to me. Now, back to verse 4. Now to him that worketh is the reward, not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Listen, let's say it again. To him that worketh is the reward, not reckoned of grace, but of debt. I hope you're getting this today. Help him, Jesus. What I need to say is this. The same gospel that provides your money is the same gospel that heals your body. Listen, the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And we're building medical centers over here saying God is merging his power with medicine, uh, which is ridiculous. And over here, we're saying God supplies our needs financially. And you see, they're both the same gospel and they don't work in the <laughs> in one case and they do work in another. I don't understand none of that. That's a work of the flesh. Now back to Romans 4. 4. To him that worketh is the reward, not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Righteousness is grace. Abraham believed God, and God preached the gospel to Abraham. It tells us that in Genesis 3, 8, and the works didn't do it. Listen, Abraham had to believe God. Verse 5, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Abraham had to be justified by faith. He believed what God said. Yet Abraham had to believe God for 25 years and his heart was prepared. See, He was justified by obeying the father and then the son came, but he believed him. He relied on him. He trusted in him for 25 years, 25 years. Please hear that. Receive that. 